In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today comes from the uh, it comes from a, a story in the book of Matthew that Jesus is trying to give some real life application to his disciples in the form of the Sermon on the Mount. But to help you really understand where he's going with this, I thought that a secular example might be helpful. This weekend, for the first time, I sat down with some friends and watched the Disney movie from the, I guess, mid-90s, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I've never seen it before. You know, somehow that one just escaped my notice. Somehow I was just never in a situation where I saw it. And it's not something that's really considered a Disney classic. It's good, and it definitely has its moments. I liked the movie. But it's not one that's considered like a, a huge Disney success like Aladdin or something like that. And so somehow I just over time, never did have an opportunity where I sat down and watched it. So we did that this weekend, and one thing that kind of struck me about this particular story is Judge Frollo, the villain character in this movie, he is having lustful thoughts about one of the other characters, Esmeralda, and I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for you, maybe you're like me and just haven't seen it in all these years, but I am you know, giving some spoilers here. So he finds himself lusting after this attractive young woman. And to deal with this, he does something that struck me as very odd, and that's he gave God two options, which giving God a couple of options and basically telling him he has to comply with one of them, that's a super bad idea anyway. It's a really, really bad uh, mindset to be in when you're approaching the Almighty. But he gives God two options, essentially either... Let me have her, and, and let me take her and, and let her be my wife so that I can, you know, sexually have her, even though they didn't expressly say that, because, of course, it's a, a Disney movie. And then the second one there was, or let me kill her so I will no longer be tempted by her. Now, that's interesting because you'll notice that both of those options, regardless of which one came true... In both cases, they were a removal of temptation, not an overcoming of it. Which I find fascinating that this character in this particular movie, the way that he sees it, the way he understands it is, the best possible option for him is to just have the temptation removed from him completely. To not have to deal with it anymore. Either by slaking his lust, by having her as his wife or by having her no longer existing and therefore he can't be tempted by her anymore. Now, there's a couple of reasons why that's a really dumb idea, because, of course, lust can take many different forms, and um, if, if that's the case, then are you just going to kill every woman that you're ever attracted to? And so there's a myriad of reasons why, theologically, it's a very shaky, uh, shaky ground to be standing on, but I think to really gain some more insight and to get deeper into the issue it makes sense for us to go to a passage that addresses lust specifically in Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30, where Jesus says, You have heard it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone that looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, Christ is very obviously using an extreme example to try to get attention, trying to get the audience, okay guys, perk up, make sure that you're dialing in to what I'm saying here. Because this is something that is shocking for modern readers as, as well as it would have been for people back then. And I do not believe, nor am I suggesting, that Christ is literally saying, maim yourself to get rid of your temptation. 
What he is saying is you go to extreme measures. That because sin is something that separates you from God, because it mars the relationship that we're supposed to have with our Heavenly Father, you do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get that out of your life, you do it. Well, now, hang on, that sounds an awful lot like what Frollo did, isn't it? I mean, wasn't that taking extreme measures? This is a guy that was willing to and, and almost succeeded in carrying out his plan to murder the object of his lust to remove that temptation from him. That was Judge Frollo just carrying out what Jesus said, isn't it? Well, it should be very obvious to anybody that has, A, either seen the movie or knows me at all, that I'm going to say, heck no. But why? They do seem similar. They do seem like taking extreme measures to get sin out of your life. So what's the difference? Here's the difference. In Frollo's case, he wanted to hurt other people to have his temptation removed from him. In the case that Jesus is talking about, he is saying that a person needs to make personal sacrifices that hurt him in order to keep himself from sinning. You see, the person that takes on the harm, in Jesus' case, and the one that he presents in that scenario, is you. You're the one that sacrifices, not the other person. You're the one that takes responsibility for removing your temptation, not the other person. And I know that this is an extreme example, but it's an extreme example that has real-world application in real-life scenarios that we have. We do need to take extreme measures to do whatever it takes to get rid of our sin, but that doesn't include hurting other people in the process. You see, in our quest to remove sin from our lives, which is a, a noble goal, of course, we cannot allow that to act as an excuse for us to neglect our Christian duties to our brothers and sisters or to break one of God's other laws in pursuit of that goal. See, you can't just pick and choose. You have to take the whole law, because, of course, what Frollo was missing is, in his attempt to destroy his lust, what he was doing is would be destroying another human life. He would be wrathful towards this person, and he would be shedding innocent blood, somebody that has done him no wrong. And so what he was doing is he was taking one tiny little sliver of, of God's law that he thought was really important and made that supersede every other aspect of it. This is a common problem, not just with people in the secular world, but also with people in the church that claim to be Christians. That sometimes we'll take one little piece of God's law that we think is super important, and we'll just bulldoze over all the rest of it in pursuit of that one part that we deem the most important. But ultimately... Even though Jesus did ascribe that some laws are, are you know, more important than others, he said that the first law is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say, and ignore all the other laws so that you can pursue that goal. What he said was, the entire law hangs on this, so it has priority. But you still have to follow the other laws that go with it, too. And I do think it also serves as a, a way of telling us that you have to be intentional when it comes to sin because sin is not going to go away on its own. You have to take action. In the example that Jesus is giving here in the Sermon on the Mount, you have to be the one that makes a decision, I'm going to get this out of my life. And I am going to take extreme measures if that's what it takes to do. Look, if you've got a problem, for example, uh, with being lazy, Maybe you have to take extreme measures with that. You, you have to do some things that motivate you to do something to get moving. If you have an issue with not going to church or being unempathetic, you, you've got to take intentional measures to try to work on that. If you have an issue with gossip, maybe you have to stop hanging around some of the people that will tempt you to gossip, at least for a little while, uh, or maybe even permanently. If you're tempted with lust and there's one particular person that you find it really hard to be around, maybe you just don't be around that person anymore. If you have an issue with, for example, and, and this is one that affects a lot of men around my age in the church, and we've talked about it on this show before, if one of the things that you deal with are things like pornography, 
then you got to take extreme measures for that. Maybe keep your phone away from where you sleep, away from your bed, or maybe even install a self-imposed internet filter to make sure that you can't get to that stuff, or at least, and give somebody else the passwords. You can't even cheat. So you can't even log in and override it yourself. Or maybe create some kind of accountability with you and another Christian when it comes to whatever pet sin it is that you have that you're trying to get out of your life. The point in all of that is, we have to take this fight seriously. Because if we ignore it and we take it casually and we just kind of figure, ah, oh, well, you know, I have some sin, but, you know, God's grace is enough and, and whatever. No, that's, that's not what we're called to do. And if we're going to take a serious look at this or, or any other sin, just like Judge Frollo, we have to have that kind of zeal to get it out of our lives. We also have to be conscientious and remember that we have to follow the whole law, not just that one particular thing that we're trying to get rid of. So ultimately, our temptation has to be conquered internally. It has to be on us. We're the one that has to give the sacrifice, that has to give some things up, maybe some things that are benign and not sinful, but things that we have to give up nonetheless in the pursuit of being pure and trying to be holy the way that our Father is holy. That's what we're commanded to do. So by all means, be zealous in your pursuit of purity, but do not blame others for your own shortcomings. And most importantly, don't ignore the positive commands of God's law. Because in the situation with Judge Frollo, that problem, that inconsistency that he had where he wasn't following the law, that would have been solved not only by knowing that you're not supposed to murder somebody, which seems pretty obvious, but it also would have been solved if he had just had some love and some mercy and some grace and had been looking out for other people as opposed to just himself. And so when we pursue the, the eradication of sin from our lives, we should do it to the best of our ability, but we should also be very aware of the fact and, and be striving for doing the things that God's law commands us to do, that God wants us to do. And by doing that, that's going to help us in our quest to get sin out of our life. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.